Welcome to Rose Red Homestead. I am holding a bottle of pure, clean water. Mm. You know, we take clean water for granted in today's society because all we have to do is just turn on our tap and it's there. But in times of natural disasters like fire, flood, earthquakes, or hurricanes, Clean water coming into our homes is one of the first things to go. In 2017, when Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, the aftermath flooding was horrible. That flood water was just treacherous. When the EPA tested it, it had 6,000 times the safe amount of bacteria in that water. Not only that, the water had washed through establishments like dry cleaning places and auto repair shops, and it picked up all of those chemicals. And three of their water treatment plants had become compromised with the floodwaters washing through, so there was sewage in all of the um, flood water as well. Hundreds of people got sick just by coming into contact with that water. So what does it take to turn water like the worst case scenario, Houston floodwaters, into nice, clean, pure water like this? That's exactly what we're going to be talking about when we come right back. When thinking about preparing for emergency situations in which we will need to uh, provide water for our families, clean water to drink and to um, cook with, um, there's just no possible way that we can prepare for every possibility. So preparing against a worst case scenario, like the floods in Houston, is a pretty safe way that if we can take that water and turn it into clean water, we can pretty much deal with almost anything. So what, what does it take? What do we need? What knowledge do we have to have? What equipment and supplies do we have to have? Well, the first thing that we need to talk about is in the knowledge category, and that is exactly what is meant by two processes that are often conflated and crushed together, meaning the same thing in today's society. But we really need to unpack each one separately so that we understand those processes. The first process is filtering, and the second process is sanitizing. And if we were dealing with worst case scenario water, the first thing we would want to do is filter that water. Now, because that water is so gross, we would most likely want to do pre-filtering before we put that water through any expensive filter we might have. So what might we have that we could use for a pre-filter, just looking around our homes to see what we might have that's available? Well, there are a couple things. In fact, probably a whole lot more than a couple of things. Um, a dish towel, just a regular common dish towel. And with a dish towel, you can um, fold it up and make more than one layer. And then you just simply pour the water first time through this pre-filter into a separate container. And of course, you haven't filtered out a whole lot of the bad stuff. All you've taken out is the large chunks. And then you can run that through your filtering system. And we'll get to talking about that in a little bit. Another thing uh, would be just coffee filters. Now, we're not coffee drinkers, but I keep these coffee filters both in our... Um, bug out bags and on my emergency supply shelf because I know that these coffee filters, and I have a whole lot of them, I know that they will come in very handy and will be a first defense against unclean water that I might need to pre-filter. So what exactly is filtering? And if we talk only about filtering and not any other process, not sanitizing, not anything else, but just filtering, we know that when we set up a filter, we have some kind of a barrier 
like this tea towel or this dish towel that has a certain porosity, has a certain size of holes in it, and it will keep larger stuff on this side. If the water is flowing in this direction, it will trap larger stuff on this side and let everything that is smaller than the pores, the holes in, the, in this filter, whatever we're using, get to the other side. And pre-filtering is really good for taking out the big chunks. But when we are talking about worst case scenario water, we're going to want to not only just pre-filter to get out the big debris, but then we need to um, think that the size of the holes in our filter, the pores, the porosity, needs to be narrower and narrower and narrow until we get down to the micron level. And filters in today's um, market are all labeled with how big their filters are in terms of the porosity. So we'll see, and, and the measurement is usually microns. And so there are two micron filters. There are one micron filters. So how big is a micron anyway? Or we should probably say, how tiny is a micron? Well, if you were to pull out one of your hairs and chop it in half and look at it straight on, the diameter of that hair is 20 microns. So a micron is pretty small, but is 20 microns small enough to get out some of the really awful things that we're often concerned about with water filtering? And the answer is no, it is not. We have to go smaller and smaller and smaller. So what about one micron? Is one micron big enough or small enough? Would that keep us safe? Well, a one micron filter would take out some of the protozoans like Giardia or Cryptosporilium. Both protozoans are nasty. We don't want them in our water, but they can be um, filtered out. Uh, so most can be filtered out if you have a filter that has a one micron pore. Um, also, there are some bacteria that you would trap, but not all bacteria. And so what would be left? What could go through that filter? Viruses could get through there. And then, of course, any of the chemicals that are dissolved in the water would go right through because they're not chunky at all. They wouldn't be trapped. So we could also, with a one micron, trap any algae. So we could, with a one micron, we could eliminate a lot of those things. <clears throat> but that still isn't big enough for what we really need. A lot of the filters on the market today are either 0.1 or 0.2. That is one-tenth of a micron or two-tenths of a micron. And that will get rid of a whole lot more. It should get rid of almost all of the bacteria. In fact, it would. It would get rid of all of the bacteria. But what it doesn't even touch is viruses. Viruses and chemicals would not be touched. So when we go into the woods and do a three-day backpacking trip, these sport filters that are so prevalent in today's market, most of them are either 0.1 or 0.2. And uh, manufacturers know that in North American waters, in streams and rivers and lakes, there are rarely, if ever, any viruses. So making their filters for sport use at the 0.1 or 0.2, one-tenth of a micron or two-tenths of a micron pores is pretty safe for backpackers. But would we trust running Houston water through that filter and then drink it? Ooh, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. So how tiny would the pores have to be in order to trap virus? Well, they would have to be four one-thousandths of a micron. And if we had a filter whose pores were that tiny, it would take forever to any water, for any water to get through it. So filtering just simply does not take care of viruses. Something else has to happen in order to kill those viruses. And that leads us right into our next step, which is sanitizing that water. So once we pre-filter and filter the water down to the smallest that we possibly can with whatever filters we have, and I'll be showing you some filters here toward the end, then we will need to treat that water with something that will actually kill viruses and anything else that might be in there. So what do we use? 
Well, there are several different things that we can do. We can boil the water for 10 minutes. However, in emergency situations, it is not always easy to find enough fuel or a pot or whatever we might need to boil water. And right along with that is we can distill the water, which takes even fancier equipment. So pretty much we need to, while, that, while we could do that, we want, um, we want to have other possibilities in place that we could use. We could use the sun's light. Um, the World Health Organization has said that all we need to do to purify water is to take a, a clear container, plastic or glass, and I would recommend glass because certain kinds of plastic in the heat or in direct sunlight will give off some of their chemicals um, right into the water. So I have bottles, two quart bottles, um, canning jars that I would use for this. And then we would just lay the bottle out in the sun for six hours, says the World Health Organization. And the UV, UV light is ultraviolet. The ultraviolet light coming from the sun would take care of all of the viruses and other bad living organisms that might be in here. It purifies the water. And we could also put foil, aluminum foil underneath. So the sun rays comes down and then back up through the water. So they're getting that double treatment of the sun's rays, the UV um, rays to uh, purify the water. So another purifier is um, iodine that comes in water purification tablets or other chemicals that come in water purification tablets, which may be fine when we're on a backpacking trip. But the volume of water that we're going to be doing in an emergency situation makes that a very, very expensive alternative. So what can we use? Well, pretty much everybody's go-to is chlorine. Chlorine is very effective and chlorine will indeed kill viruses and this is a great water purifier provided this Clorox has not been stored on your shelf for longer than six months. Um, one of the things that happens with Clorox because it is made with chlorine and chlorine is the disinfecting chemical there and chlorine occurs naturally as a gas. And so in this liquid form, that the chlorine gas is always escaping into the air. And in fact, that good old Clorox clean smell, that's chlorine gas that we are smelling, which means that there's not as much chlorine in the Clorox solution as there was when we first started. And so all the time that you're storing this on the shelf, it's going to be losing chlorine gas which means that by six months, it is not as powerful as we think it is. And when we think about what we might want on our shelves to purify worst case scenario water, I don't know that we want to take a chance with Clorox because it does not store well long term. So is there an alternative? And the answer, thankfully, is yes, indeed, there is. And I'm going to introduce that to you right now. This is calcium hypochlorite. Now, Clorox is sodium hypochlorite. So this is almost the same thing, but it is calcium instead of sodium. And I keep this in um, a, a large jar that has been carefully labeled with the uh, chemical symbol and a little warning sign that it is dangerous, it is poisonous, just so that it reminds me and um, to keep it up out of the reach of children. And so, um, and it also will give off a few little fumes that I want to trap inside here. I don't want them dissipating into wherever it is that I have this stored. So this is calcium hypochlorite, or you may know it by another name, pool shock. So those of you that own pools, you are familiar with this product. You just dump this in your pool to take care of bacteria and whatever when your readings are too high. So this is phenomenal stuff for us to shore on, store on our emergency shelves for purification of water. But here are a couple of caveats. Number one, it needs to be 68% strength or higher. Anything between 68 to 70, 75 is perfect. And the recipe that I'm gonna give you in just a minute will work for anything within that range. The second important point, and this is critical, you do not want any other active ingredients in this pool shock besides the sodium hypochlorite, I mean, excuse me, the calcium hypochlorite. And so right here on the front of this label, picking up my glasses here, 
It says, active ingredient, calcium hypochlorite, 73%, other ingredients, 27%, total, 100%. Those other ingredients aren't labeled, so they are inert. And that's exactly what we want. We don't want any algae killer in here, although this will take care of some of the algae. We don't want any other chemical. We don't want any coloring. This is going to be for our drinking water. And so the only thing we want in here is calcium hypochlorite. Now, I did a reconnaissance tour around our area, just checking in with some of the, um, uh, some of the discount houses and the home, like Home Depot and Lowe's, to look in their pool section to see what I could find. And honestly, I could not find anything in the pool shock area that had only the um, calcium hypochlorite. It had all other kinds of additives as well. So I get this online. It is called TKO. And um, it comes in a single pound package like this, or you can buy six of these. When you buy six of these, they are about $6 a piece. When you buy just one, oh, I think they were $12. I, can't, I don't remember because I didn't buy just one. I bought six and then uh, several friends of us um, each have one. But I'm going to get some more. Even though these store forever um, on your shelf, um, in case anything should happen to this one, I want a backup or two. So I'm going to get some more. So how do we use this? Um, it's in powder form. And so um, it's a two-step process, and this is really important. And by the way, the EPA approves of this uh, to use to sanitize water. So we're in, in good company with the EPA. So um, it's a two-step process. This is very, very powerful. So the first thing we want to do is we want to mix some powder into some water to make a base solution. And we can think of that base solution just like we would a jug of Clorox. We still need to dilute it from there to put it in our water. So the base solution here, um, it, it goes to the bottom. So before I would sanitize water, I would shake this up. Now, um, and again, once it's in a liquid form, the chlorine gas is going to dissipate. So I don't mix up very much at a time because the only thing I'm going to be using this for is for sanitizing water. But the recipe for this is, um, one heaping teaspoon in two gallons of water. So it would be one heaping half teaspoon in a gallon of water. Now I've done the math and I now know that it takes one eighth of a teaspoon for a pint. And interestingly enough, when I was, when I was looking for something that that I could use to measure out one eighth of a teaspoon. I remembered that in my drawer, I had this set of tiny, tiny measuring spoons. One of my friends gave this to me once as a joke, and I actually have a second set now too. But this is a dash and a smidgen and a pinch. And so, um, and then I found out that th these are sold. And I wondered if the measurements were the same or if this was just some made up thing. So I compared the volumes in this set with the volumes in my second set and they are identical. And so when I measured everything out, as it turns out, the dash is the very same thing as one eighth of a teaspoon. So how cool is that? So I can just dip into that powder and drop it in a pint of water and I have my base solution. And I have made little labels. This says uh, calcium hypochlorite base solution. So now, once I have this base solution, the recipe is not the same as it was for Clorox. It is one part of this base solution to 100 parts of water. So this pint would do 12 and a half gallons of water. 100 pints equals 12 and a half gallons. And so it's one to 100. So that's very cool. And so um, you can uh, do the math and then even get the, the lower equivalents down if you don't want to um, 
do 12 and a half gallons at one time. So this is our go-to water sanitizer. And this is what we will do after we filter it. All right, now, many of the filters on the market today do both things in one. And I'm gonna show you a couple of filters. So this filter, it's a sport filter. It is a, a catadine, and this is the catadine pocket. And it's a pump filter. And the way that it works is you drop this end in the river or the stream or the floodwaters or whatever. And um, while many of the sport manufacturers, sport filter manufacturers, say find clean running water or clear running water, um, this one says you can just drop this in the water. It doesn't necessarily specify that. Most of them also specify to keep it out of stagnant water. So this is more designed for backpacking when you have uh, clear running streams or rivers of some kind. Uh, but, but you can also use it for more contamination as well. The filter in here is ceramic, but it is embedded with silver. And the ceramic is the filter. The size of this filter is 0.2. So I can filter out most things, not viruses. But the silver embedded in here is a disinfectant. And so as the water progresses through, that silver compound that is mixed with the um, ceramic does kill most things. Now, I have to say that if I were doing Houston flood water, I would pre-filter, then I would filter using this, and then I would sanitize. So I'm not gonna take any chances. Um, we have another filter that is similar to this one. It is also a ceramic filter, but it has carbon embedded in it. Now that carbon will take out the smells and quite a few of the chemicals that are there. So, and, and a lot of filters will also take out the chemicals that are the nasty chemicals that are there, thankfully. So, um, the, and knowing the parameters of your filter is just so incredibly important. Now, um, there are on the market today a lot of the straw type filters. Now, this is not one of them, this is just a regular straw. But I just wanted to show you um, I do not own a straw filter like the Life Straw or the Go Straw or whatever any the other straws are because I, think about this now if you are if you are needing to sanitize some pretty contaminated water and all you have is a little straw filter like this you are required to get down to the level of where the water is now if you're on a riverbed that means you lie on your belly and project your body out far enough so that you can find a cleaner spot and then you suck up the water. So here you are trying to suck up the water and you're about four or five inches from the water itself. May not be too bad out in the backwoods, but that Houston water, I don't want to get my face anywhere near that water. And not only that, but sucking that stuff up takes a long time and it's just a filter. And so when it comes, it comes directly from the yucky water into your mouth. So what if it needs further sanitizing? No way to do that. Now, some of the filters of uh, manufacturing companies have gotten a little smarter and they're putting them inside water bottles because it is very inconvenient. I cringe when I hear people say, oh, for my bug out bag, this is the filter that I have. That, that is scary to me because read the labels, know the size of the filter, also know if there's something else there that will sanitize the water before it hits your mouth. This is um, our bug out filter. This is a Seychelle, S-E-Y-C-H-E-L-L-E, -E -L -L -E, just like the Seychelle Islands. This is an incredible little filter. It is not perfect. None of the filters is perfect. But the, what this one does, and um, this is the advanced. If you purchase a Seychelles, be sure that you get the advanced filter. And these are interchangeable. You just unscrew these and screw them on, and they have four or five or six different filters. The very best all-around one is the advanced filter. 
the advanced filter can go directly from yucky water to your mouth. It takes out bacteria, it takes out protozoa, it takes out asbestos, it takes out even radioactive fallout, and it takes out viruses. And it does that um, with iodine, a combination of, of a filter and iodine and charcoal. So how this works is that, at, and with this one, you can use any water, stagnant water, Houston flood water, anything. So you just scoop up the water, you drop the filter in, you pop up the straw part, and then you squeeze, and the water is squeezed through the filter mechanism right up into your mouth, and it is safe to drink. So Jim and I carry one of these in each of our 72-hour bug out bags. We have one in each of our vehicles, and we have some extra ones here. Um, these are available on Amazon, and you can buy uh, the, the replacement filters as well. So it is always a good idea when we are thinking about emergency preparedness to be sure that we have backup replacement parts for these. And as always, read, read, read the instructions. Some of the filters have to be cleaned after every use and then dried out. So know what the expectations are for any filter that you choose. Now, the most recommendations, as I have read and read a lot of, of um, material on being prepared to sanitize water in case of a long-term emergency, is to have a combination of filters and ways to sanitize so that we're not just relying on one single thing, but we have a redundancy system so that we can filter with this filter or that filter, we can sanitize with this material or put it out in the sun or use um, chlorine in some, in some way. Um, if we have stored clean water, that should give us peace of mind for however long our stores of clean water last. But we all need to be prepared to be able to filter um, water which becomes necessary after our clean water runs out. So the more options we have, the better prepared we will be. Now I want to show you one last filter. This is a Berkey filter. It is a new purchase for us. After I did all of the research that I needed to do to make this video, I realized that our own supplies were a little bit lacking and that we might need something for much more longer term. Now many people use this Berkey filter, one like this. This one is, um, this one does three and a half gallons. It's the Berkey Royal. And I found, it, I found it on sale for a fabulous buy. So we went ahead and bought one. And many people just use these uh, constantly because the water coming out of their tap doesn't taste very good. We are very lucky to have fabulous water coming out of our tap. In fact, it is Jurassic water from under the Canaan Mountains behind us, and it is spring water, and it is just as clear and delicious, the best water in any house we have ever had. But because we are preparing for long-term emergencies, we went ahead and got one of these, and it has a little spout right here, and you just put your receptacle right under here. The water that I put in here was the, in the top part was the test water, and uh, we were instructed to put red food coloring in it, to dye it red, to s test the filter and be sure we'd installed everything correctly. So this is the very water that I had put the red food coloring in. It was what I was drinking at the beginning of the video. So this is a fabulous one. So it is very likely that if we had a Houston flood situation near here, that I would filter it through other things first and then put it in here. And the Berkey takes out everything, which is pretty amazing. This is the only one that I was able to find that does everything besides this little Seychelles. Uh, one thing about the Seychelles is you need to keep it more than half full or it's not very efficient, it is harder to drink from. So I hope this has been helpful to you. You may have many wonderful ideas that you would like to share with others as well. So put your comments below and um, feel free to subscribe to our videos. 
We're doing one more on water and several other things about um, emergency preparedness. So if you subscribe, then you will get the notification when our new videos come out. So thank you for being with us and we will see you next time.